Namaste and a very, very good evening to all of you. I welcome you to my channel, The Outlier. My name is Mithun. In today's video, I'll be talking about bank loan default prediction. We will be using Microsoft Azure to build a model using which we can identify those customers who default on the payment of a loan. Even before I demonstrate how Microsoft Azure can be used to identify customers who default on the payment of a loan, may I request you to subscribe to my channel, also like and share my videos. Let me begin by introducing the data set to you. The data set, as you can see here, is in spreadsheet. I've got customer ID. Also, I've got customer demographic details like age, education level, number of years with the current employer, number of years that the customer has spent in the current address, his income level, debt to income ratio, credit debt details, other debt. And the last variable is historically, whether he has defaulted or not. The number one basically indicates that the first customer has defaulted. The number zero indicates that the customer has not defaulted. Using this data set, we will be building a prediction model. Let me come back to Azure. So this is how Azure Canvas looks like. The first thing that I need to do is import this particular data set. Since I already have this data set ready here, all that I need to do is drag and drop this particular data set to the canvas on the right hand side. Once I drag and drop this particular data set, I can right click and choose the option visualize. It takes a couple of seconds to run this particular option. You can see here, the sample size in the data set is 850. The number of columns here would be 10. We are familiar with some of these variables like age, education, number of years spent with the current employer, so on and so forth. Let me examine the last variable here. The last variable is ID. The last but one variable is our dependent variable, namely default. When you select the variable default, you can look at the sample size of each of the categories. For example, when you look at zero, we have around 500 cases who are non-defaulters and roughly we have around 183 cases who have defaulted. Let me close this particular dialog box. Now that we have imported the data set, what we are going to do is we are going to feed this into another node, which will allow us to select the desired columns that we will be using in the data set. In the search button, what I'm going to type here is select columns. You can see here the moment I type select columns under the manipulation feature, we have an item which says select columns in the data set. What is this used for? As the description says, it selects columns to include or exclude from the data set in an operation. Formerly, it was called as project columns. All that I need to do is drag and drop this particular node to the canvas on the right hand side. From the output port, I'm going to make a connection to the input port of select columns in the data set. There is a warning message here. And as you can see here in the properties window, select columns in the data set. Let me hit this particular button, launch column selector. In the left hand side, these are all the available columns that I have. I'm going to choose all the demographic variables, also the variable default and push it into the canvas to the right hand side. The only variable that I'm going to exclude is the variable customer ID because it is not of any use in machine learning models. So there is one variable customer ID, which I'm going to exclude all these variables I'm going to include to build a model. Let me go ahead and tick this particular option. So I've selected the desired columns. Once you select the desired columns, what you need to do is to execute this particular option, you can click on the run button. So this particular option has run successfully. What is the third step? In any machine learning model, 
we'll have to split the data set into training and test data set. To split the data set as training and test, I'm going to use a feature which is called as split data. The moment I type split in the search button, you can see here there's a feature which is called a split data. I can drag this and drop it to the canvas to the right hand side. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to establish a connection from the previous node to split data. As you can see here, the numbers one and the numbers two here, these ports will generate the training data set as well as the test data set. But even before executing this particular node, let me look at the properties window. Splitting mode would be based on split rows. The fraction of rows in the final output data set, I'll choose 80%. The default option is 0.5. I'll choose this as 0.8, implying 80% of the records will be used for training, 20%, the balance 20% of the records will be used for testing the data set. Once I've selected the fraction that will be used for training the data set, I can select this particular node and hit the run button. Fine, we have run this particular option successfully. What is the next step? The next step would be to identify which are the variables which have the highest predictive power, which are those independent variables which have the highest predictive power which tell us whether a customer is going to default or not default. To do this, we can use the option filter based feature selection. I'm going to type in the search button filter based feature selection. Drag this and drop it to the canvas on the right hand side. I'm going to use the training data set. So let me use the information from the first port and feed it into feature based, filter based feature selection. This is not going to work simply because there are certain options that I have not specified. The default option is Pearson's correlation. Had the dependent variable been a scale variable, I would have used Pearson's correlation. But the dependent variable default is a binary variable. It's a dichotomous variable having values 1 and 0. So Pearson's correlation is not appropriate. I'll choose the option chi-squared. The next option that I need to specify here would be target column, launch column selector. Under this particular option, I'll choose the last variable because the target variable here would be default. Whether a customer has defaulted on the payment of a loan or not, that is the dependent variable. And hence, I'm going to choose the variable default as the target column. Let me tick this particular option. I'll be executing this particular option to look at the variables which have the highest predictive power. You see here, once you see a tick mark, it means that this particular option has run successfully. Let me right click. And now I'm going to choose the option features and then say visualize. You can see here, the most important drivers would be debt to income ratio. It has the highest predictive power of 97.38. The second important driver would be the number of years that a customer has spent with a current employer. The third important variable would be credit debt. So this has a predictive power of 39.83. So the top three drivers, the most important variables would be debt to income ratio, the number of years that a customer has spent with the current employer, and then credit debt details. We also have other variables like number of years spent with the current in the current address and the age of the customer. As you can see here, the values go on decreasing, meaning that the successive variables, as you go to the right side, the last few variables have very little predictive power. So this variable, this model will be mostly built using the variables like debt to income ratio, 
the number of years spent with the current employer, credit debt details, so on and so forth. Let me close this particular window. So what we have done at this stage is we have identified we have identified the most important drivers for a customer to default on the payment of a loan. The next option here is to train the model. I repeat, the next option here is to train the model. So let me go ahead and locate the option train model. So this is the option that I'll be using to train the model. As you can see here, train model will accept two inputs. The question is, which are these two inputs? Firstly, we need a machine learning model to train the data set. We also need the training data set. Let's first decide on the machine learning model. Since the outcome variable is dichotomous, implying whether a customer is a defaulter or a non-defaulter, the there are only two categories in the dependent variable. So I will be using what is called as two class logistic regression model. Two class logistic regression model. So this is the machine learning model that I will be using to train the model. Two class logistic regression model. Let me go ahead and establish a connection of the model with the training data set. Once I establish the connection, the first part of the work is done. The second thing that I need to do is, I also need to feed the training data set, which is coming from the split data into the train model. Here you can see here, there's a warning message, which means that I will have to specify additional details, only then this particular feature will run. Train model, I have to launch the column selector. It says select a single column. So this is the target column that I need to specify. So the target column is default. So this is the dependent variable. Since two class logistic regression model is a supervised learning technique, I have to specify the dependent variable. I've already discussed that whether a customer will default on the payment of a loan or not, that is the dependent variable. The rest of the variables will be used as independent variables. Let me go ahead and execute this particular option. It looks like the model has run successfully. At this stage, what do we have? We have split the data set. 80% has gone into training. 20% has gone into test. We've used the two class logistic regression model to train our machine learning model. What is the next step? The next step would be to score the machine learning model on the test data set. Let me choose the option score. Once we choose the option score, then we can drag this and drop it under the score model, under the we can drag and drop the score model option to the canvas on the right side. Now, there are two input items that it expects. The first is the trained model. So this is where we have trained the model. I'll be establishing a connection between train model and score model. The second thing that I need to do is, I need to tell Azure, which is the data set that it has to use to score the model. So this is where the test data set, which we have so far not used under the split data will come into picture. So there are two things. One is train the model. And then once you train the model, you'll be applying that on the fresh data set. You will be scoring it on the 20% of the data set. Let me go ahead and execute this particular feature. Fantastic, the model has now run successfully. Now, as a last step with any machine learning model, what we need to do is we need to evaluate the performance of the model. How do we evaluate the performance of the model? Microsoft Azure 
has an option which is called as evaluate model under the evaluate feature. So let me just go ahead and drag and drop this particular option, which is called as evaluate model. I'll be establishing a connection between score model and evaluate model. I'll have to run this particular option. This model has run successfully. Right click on this particular option and then you can see visualize this particular option is what i'll be choosing to see the output of evaluation fine in the output window what you can see here is what is called as roc curve this is what is called as roc now roc basically stands for receiver operating characteristic curve let us look at the area under the curve when I look at the area under the curve, AUC, it is 0 0.79, roughly 80%. AUC lies between 0 and 1. If the AUC value is close to 1, if the AUC is greater than 0 0.7, we can go ahead and say that our model is good. On the other hand, if the AUC value is below 0 0.5, it means that our model is not good. Since we are getting a high AUC of 0 0.8, we can go ahead and say that our model fits the data well and our model is also generating good level of prediction. To the left side, you can see the total number of positives, the total number of false negatives, the total number of false positives, the total number of true, uh, true negatives, positive label. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, just giving you the coding for positive label as well as the negative label, that is one and zero. But what is really important is true positive, false negative, false positive, true negative. It is just identifying the number of cases which have uh, which have uh, been identified here. What I would like to look at is basically the accuracy measure. The accuracy measure is 74%, which is again, uh, which is again a good sign. Accuracy always lies between zero and one. Usually, if the accuracy level is greater than 0 0.7, it means that the model is usable. The model is a good model. On the other hand, if the accuracy level is less than 0 0.7, we need to build an alternative model or we need to go back, prepare the data set and rebuild the model. Next, we have what is called as precision. Precision is a very, very important metric. If you, if you look at any blog, it says that precision is calculated using a simple formula, true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. So true positives will be in the numerator divided by true positives plus false positives. Now precision tells me what? Precision tells me out of all the predictions, out of all the predicted defaulters, how many actually defaulted? I repeat, out of all the predicted defaulters, how many actually defaulted. High precision is an indication that we have low false positive rate. I repeat, high precision is always an indication of low false positive rate. Here, the precision value that I'm getting is 0 0.62, which is a good sign. However, I would have liked had the precision value been greater than 0 0.7. Let's look at the recall value. The recall value is very, very poor here. The recall value again should be greater than 0 0.7. What exactly is recall? When we speak about recall, it measures the model's ability to detect the positive samples. I repeat, it measures the model's ability to detect the positive samples. How do we calculate recall? Recall is simply the ratio between true positives to that of the sum of true positives and false negatives. So in the numerator, you have true positives and in the denominator, you have the sum of true positives and false negatives. A high recall value indicates that higher the recall, more the positive samples detected. I repeat, higher the recall, more the positive samples detected. Lower the recall, fewer the positive samples detected. Finally, we have what is called as the F1 score, which is simply a harmonic mean between recall and precision value. I repeat, 
F1 score is simply a harmonic mean between the precision and the recall value. You can take a look at the true positives, false negatives, false positives, as well as true negative. Azure prints a lot of details. If you want, you can look at each decile and the number of positive samples, negative samples, so on and so forth. You can also take a look at the threshold value. Now, if you increase the threshold here, you can see here what happens to the accuracy level. You can also play around by decreasing the threshold value. So with this, we have come to the end of this particular video. In this particular video, we saw how to build a prediction model to identify whether the customers will default on the payment of a loan or not. We used two class logistic regression model. We split the data set into training and testing. We trained the model and we applied it on 20% testing data set. Additionally, if you recall, we were also able to identify which are those variables which have a high predictive power. With this, I've come to the end of today's video. Thank you very much for watching this video. Have a great day.